Hi all, my name is Bree Helton and I'm here to introduce uh, Chloe who will be doing a talk on bug bounties for us in just a moment and such. Um, in the meantime, just wanted to give a few quick announcements for everything. Uh, just to announce that the CTF will be closing later on today. Please drop into the CTF village if you have any questions or just to check your status on that if you've been competing and such. And also to say our closing keynote today will be at 4.30. Um, if you would like to join after our last talks at 4 p.m. and then swap over to the um, track one to get to the closing keynote and everything, we greatly appreciate and have you close out the event with us. Thank you very much and enjoy this presentation by Chloe on Bug Bounty. Hi everyone, my name is Chloe Mustagi and today we're gonna to talk about Bug Bounty, yeah. Um, so I'm happy to be here at Diana Initiative and I'm so excited for doing this talk with you. I'm just gonna let you know, I'm gonna turn off my camera for now um, so I can focus on my slides, but I promise I'll put it back on afterwards. Anyway, let's dive into this together, shall we? All right. First things first, let me share my screen. Lovely, I hope you all can see it. All right, remember to turn off camera, I'll turn it back on afterwards. So let's talk about bug bounty today. For those that don't know who I am, my name is Chloe Mistagi. I am an InfoSec advocate and activist. Um, and my day job is a VP of strategy over at Point3 Security. And when I am not doing that, I'm a co-founder of WOSEC and also the president of WOSEC as well. Um, I also had the SF Bay Area chapter. And when I'm not doing that, um, I am the founder and CEO of We Are Hackers, formerly known as Women Hackers. Um, also an organizer for the Hacker Book Club. We read books about the hacker community that are actually sometimes written by folks in the hacker community. Um, on a monthly basis and we meet every week virtually on Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific time and the author does attend it and also those are mentioned in the book as well. Um, I also am a podcaster for ITSP Magazine's The Uncommon Journey with Phil Wiley and Alyssa Miller and also a proud parent of Sherlock and Luna and that is Sherlock and Luna being such sheebs and yes they're like cats they sit on windowsills and they also like to sit on the top of the sofa and furniture. You can find me on Twitter. My DMs are always open and also Instagram. My DMs are always open. So feel free to reach out on either one that you feel more comfortable or both, whatever works best for you. All right, let's dive into the good stuff now. So today we're going to cover on different things. The what, the why, and how of Bug Bounty. Also your brain gamified, the history of Bug Bounty. Also safety first. You need to know the legal landscape the best tools to use to get started. And then, yes, we're gonna have to talk the unfortunate bits, which is there's not too many women in this field. So we gotta talk about that and talk about how to empower you if you're going into this field. And last but not least, I will be around for Q&A. So first things first, what is bug bounty? Well, it's basically a transaction between submitting a bug and getting paid. This can be paid with money, this can be paid with kudos, this can be paid with high fives, this can be paid with swag, anything really, but usually money. So why do we need bug bounty? Well, in general, companies need outsider eyes and mindsets to find vulnerabilities that their team was unable to find. That's anything bad about their own security team. It's just that sometimes we need outsiders to be able to look with diverse backgrounds to find vulnerabilities that our security team may not be able to pick up on. Bug Bounty was never created to replace security team members. It was there to be a supplement to a security program. Um, and this is why crowdsource security is so important to practice because it does keep people more safe. So how does it work? So depending on how critical the bug is, the amount of pay out is higher. Um, just note you want to get in first because there are people that start submitting duplicates because you were not there to do it first. Um, just please stay within scope is most important. Don't ever go out of scope because if you go out of scope, chances are you might get removed from a bug bounty platform. Also, if you exploit, you will definitely get removed from a bug bounty platform. So don't exploit, kids. All right, next one. So we're going to talk about how our brains are stimulated by it. If those that know about me, I am obsessed about the brain and how the brain works. And I usually bring up the brain in every single talk I do. So first things first, 
let's talk about how our brains are actually stimulated by gamification. You know, besides dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, being creative when we have anything around gamification. Um, but for those that don't know gamification, Bug Bunny is included in that. So our brains are completely stimulated by it. So we're gonna to get to know your brain a little bit. And so I want you to focus on the green region in the left side of the image called the temporal lobe. And on the right side of the image, you'll see the amygdala and hippocampus. Those are two sections within the temporal lobe that you need to know about because that is where gamification thrives. So let's first dive into the temporal lobe. So the temporal lobe is involved in processing sensory input into derived meanings for the appropriate retention of visual memory, language comprehension, and emotion association. This is where gamification thrives and where your amygdala and hippocampus are. So yeah, we're, now we're going to talk about your amygdala and hippocampus. So first things first, about the amygdala. The amygdala is where your emotion responses are and it helps your brain store memories. For example, when you're having dreams, you tend to recall your really, really, really bad dreams. Um, because there is a fear emotion attached to it. So the stronger the emotion attached to a memory, the more you're likely you're going to remember every little detail of it. This is why we recall maybe our nightmares more than any other type of dream, um, because there's an emotion, a strong emotion associated with a memory. Now, it should be mentioned that the amygdala is completely subconscious, um, but it is that type of emotional response that when a timer is going off, that you are acting a lot faster uh, because it's a fight versus flight mechanism. And if you are in a game, you are fighting to the end to try to get something done and accomplished before anyone else does to get more points. So that's the important thing to know about. Also, when it comes to your hippocampus, the hippocampus is where your short-term memories are going into long-term memories. And so the hippocampus does work around when it comes to your role and your memory, your navigation, and your emotional response as well. So the hippocampus plays such a crucial role uh, because it helps you navigate through a breach, but also helps you navigate to go deeper down a hole to find a vulnerability. All right, so I think we've talked enough about the brain now at this point because, you know, we already know now that our brain loves it. So let's start thinking more beyond that. And the first thing first is, how and when did it first start, Bug Bounty? I want you to try to think of what year that was. Okay, got an idea in your head? All right, here we go. It was 1995, October 10th, that is, um, when Netscape decided to launch their very first Bug Bounty program by offering cash rewards to those who were able to find security bugs in their Netscape Navigator 2.0 beta. They had no idea that they literally just started the first bug bounty program that would follow and become a successful business later down the road. And I want to take a look at this timeline. So this timeline was taken from Katie Mazuris. Um, she presented the history of bug bounties um, using uh, her powers with Bug Crowd um, to basically present O'Reilly Conference. And so I want you to take a look at this. And if you see here is that uh, a bunch of companies started to do their own bug bounty program themselves, but in about 2012, and I know it doesn't show this, 2012, 2013, um, that's when the bug bounty programs and platforms started coming about even more so. Because in 2012, 2013, thanks to the success of Netscape and all these other companies following Netscape and what they did, they realized, huh, I think I need help on my bug bounty program. And there's a reason for that. Because I don't know if you know about this, but um, bug bounty platforms help reduce the stress and management time and money when it comes to trying to figure out basically what, what to do when it comes to people submitting vulnerabilities or disclosing. So these platforms came about to try to reduce that stress it was the first time ever that companies didn't have to run their own bug bounty program. Instead, they worked with a middle person to connect them with the hacker community and, and be able to report vulnerabilities through them and they would help manage it. So they would let them know what are the things that they probably need to prioritize. Here are some of the bugs that they found. Here are the dupes. It helps with the communication across the hacker community and the organization as well. So 
the middle person is definitely a need because I have to admit running your own bug bounty program as a company, it's a lot of work and a lot of people are needed to do it. Um, you need to keep up with your hacker community. You need to be able to respond, keep them up to date on their submissions. Also to pay them out, to know how much to pay them out. Um, also to know what things need to be fixed, who to push the ticket to. It becomes a lot of work, you guys. And also when you have to deal with like hackers that decide they want to go outside of the scope, which is not cool to do because they're already trusting the hacker community to help them out. So once again, you're going to hear me say this often, which is please stay in scope and don't exploit because when you do that, you make the hacker community look bad because you're seriously now becoming an attacker in that moment and in that action. Not a hacker, in other words. But I want to go into this. So one thing you should know about bug bounty and vulnerability disclosure policies and programs, they go hand in hand to a certain extent. Um, and the, the one thing that we need to talk about is that we still, we still have an issue here. Uh, companies still don't trust the hacker community um, when it comes to disclosing things. They don't have a vulnerability disclosure program or any policies in place. Uh, contact information is really hard to find. And this is a scary thing. And this is the reason why we need to talk about the legal landscape. And I know this is scary, but let's dive in it together. So let's first talk about Ecofax. I'm pretty sure you all know about it and maybe it impacted you the breach, but did you know a hacker warned Ecofax that it was vulnerable to a kind of attack that later compromised the personal data of more than 147 million Americans? This is something that Motherboard reported. Also, six months after the researcher first notified the company about the vulnerability, Equifax patched it, but only after the massive breach that made headlines had already taken place, according to Equifax's own timeline. Also, we have Capital One. You know, according to the federal complaint, the breach took place in stages across March and April 2019, but Capital One only became more of the problem on July 17th when a security researcher tipped the company to a public GitHub page that something that displayed awfully look a lot like private Capital One data. But the real thing to note about is, what if no one reported the breach or shared the vulnerability that could have been patched that would have prevented the breach? And the sad thing about it is that right now, 60% of secure researchers do not report vulnerabilities. And this is due to the fear of prosecution. And this statistic was discovered by the hard work of Amit Elazari. She noticed that our laws prevent good hackers from doing what they do best, protecting you and me and everyone that we love. And she's been spearheading this movement towards having and talking about having bilateral trust agreements between the hacker community and organizations when it comes to disclosure. So the real thing is, why are they scared? So besides prosecution, looking for contact information, reading the policies have been such a burden to report vulnerabilities. And that even if they're doing everything right and they're in scope and they're not exploiting, there's still a fear that lingers. And we know this from studies. So for example, after DJI, a drone manufacturer, as you may know of, recently launched a bug bounty program of their own, there was two researchers, Sean and Kevin, um, basically, they found their bug bounty program and decided they wanted to look into it. So the DJI's bug bounty program covered all security issues in firmware application servers, including source code leak, security workaround, privacy issues within scope. These were all in within scope. Um, and so he wanted to make sure if he was going to participate with his friend that, you know, that things would be within scope. So he confirmed what was in scope by emailing them and it took two weeks for them to finally confirm the scope was correct. He then reported the vulnerability that was within scope um, and they provided him with $30,000 for the finding. However, the agreement of receiving it offered no legal protection for him. So he walked away and the revelations resulted in the company challenging his findings and seemingly threatening one with a lawsuit tied to the Computer Fraud Abuse Act, claiming he went out of scope, regardless of the fact he made sure to confirm the scope. And in return, he decided, you know what? Fine, you wanna do this with me? 
I'm going to post the entire situation with all the conversations I've ever had with you publicly. And it's a really good read to read, I have to admit. Um, if you actually go through the emails themselves, um, there are parts where DJ Hyde did not know that he was able to see the chain that was internal use. And you can see them saying how he's a threat to them. This could be a bad PR for them because he didn't want to sign or take that money. It's a really good and fascinating thing to read. But what I want to get through this is that there are laws that prevent good hacking the same way they prevent bad hacking. And we need good hacking more than ever before, especially during COVID-19. And even when we're doing something good and we're within scope, we're not exploiting, we still run into this type of situations that Kevin went into. So I wanna talk about the legal landscape because these are things that you need to know. All around the world, we have the CFAA and the DMCA. And around the world, they are called different things. But anti-hacking laws, um, oh, in Canada, for example, it's called the criminal code. Um, Anti-circumvention laws in Canada is actually called the Copyright Act. But except for the use policies, pretty much everyone knows of. But I want to talk about the anti-hacking laws, and I want to specifically look at the CFAA. So the Computer Fraud Abuse Act is a U.S. cybersecurity bill that was enacted in 1984 as an amendment to existing computer fraud law, which had been included in the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984. This law prohibits accessing a computer without authorization or in excess of authorization, also to be used when a researcher goes out of scope. This is the act used to prosecute hacking, and this was the one that they try to place on Kevin. Now, the one thing you should know about the CFAA, how it was created was because Ronald Reagan watched a movie. I don't know if you know of this movie, but it's called War Games. He watched it and he freaked out and he decided we need to do something about these hackers. They're all criminals because he thought hackers are criminals. Anyway, that's how the CFA was created. It was because he watched this movie and decided to push for it. It's sad to note that a movie can do so much, but that's where we are today because it still exists to this day. Um, now let's go to anti-circumvention laws. These are also known as copyright laws. Um, but the DMCA is a 1998 United States copyright law that implements two 1996 treaties, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, basically, it's the right to repair, seeing reverse engineering as a breach of property to companies. And last but not least, the acceptable use policy. Now, who here in the room has ever read their terms and conditions for an Apple product? Yeah, I thought so. I mean... <laughs> I mean, if you look at it, it's like 50 pages long and it's not the greatest thing to try to read. It's too much verbiage. I'm not an attorney. By the way, I'm not an attorney, so I don't even know how to digest it all. And I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of loopholes in there and basically Apple owns my life. And yeah, let's be honest, we probably all signed in and we didn't even read it. Anyway, it, it's just, it can confuse anyone and especially if English is not your first language and, and by that I mean like you're an English learner it's really hard to try to understand acceptable use policy. And this is where you run into situations of basically being prosecuted or having to deal with a legal situation because of what is written in these policies. But I wanna let you guys know that even though that these laws are around right now, the community does agree government organizations and individuals do believe that having vulnerability disclosure programs and having bug bounty is a must at this time. It's needed more than ever before because the truth of the matter is hackers are needed in this world more than ever. We are the everyday heroes that are protecting people behind scenes. And unfortunately, the press doesn't see us in that way. And it's really disheartening to see that because in reality, everyone agrees we need to have something in place to disclose, to prevent breaches from happening and protecting people around this world. And I know this is a scary subject once again, but here are some puppies to lift your spirits. I did place a cat for cat lovers as well because I know there are people that love cats more than dogs, but they're all very cute and adorable. Which one's your favorite, you guys? And no, Sherlock and Luna is not on there, and I probably should have done that, but anyway. But I want to reiterate that the good news is that there are companies starting to look into vulnerability disclosure programs and are trying to improve their legal language. 
Um, and one of those places that are, is actually pushing forward is called disclose.io. Um, it's a website that's trying to basically use in a grassroots effort to get the crowd to source what are the companies that are practicing uh, basically bilateral trust agreements, basically being able to be transparent with the hacker community of who to contact, what to expect when contacting to disclose something. Um, if there's rewards needed, what are their policies, where's the policy link of what's in scope, what's out of scope, and really being transparent because they want the hacker community to help them and work with them. Um, and they understand that it's a two-way street and it's, it's something that we both have to play with and by play, I mean, work together with doing. So I do recommend checking it out, um, especially if you're a beginner at Bug Bounty, check out Disclose.io and see what companies are listed on there uh, because you'll feel more protected in that way because you can also find out where, who to contact when you want to report a vulnerability. And just remember, once again, if you go out of scope and exploit, it's gonna be a very tricky situation for you. And I highly recommend you not doing that if you care about your life. Because no one wants to be prosecuted, let's be real. So now you have the background, the legal background, you know how the brain works. Now let's dive into how do you get started in bug bounty? So the first step, you need to know everything about Burp Suite. Burp Suite is your friend. And you can only, you don't have to like download and pay money for Burp Suite. Get the community one, which is free. It's totally fine to use that. A lot of people do. Even the top hunters out there, they still use Burp Suite community. So please use it. Um, just note you need to know how to use it pretty well. If you're gonna do any bug bounty, you need to know how Burp Suite works. Um, and the best stop for that is Port Swigger Academy um, provides great um, materials for you to know everything you can about how to use Burp Suite. Second step is read and study. Um, the Web Applications Hacker's Handbook, I have it on my bookshelf, second edition. It is old, like very old. Still pretty cool to have on it, on your shelf. It's a proud pride thing, I guess. But what you really want to probably check out is just going to Port Sorger Academy to have a better idea on how to use Burp Suite and how to exploit stuff. Um, also, there is Web Hacking 101 and, uh, by Peter Yurowski. Um, he also did a Real World Bug Hunting, which is another great book if you're getting into it. So you do have to read and study, you guys. It's just whenever you get into anything new or new field, you need to know everything about it, right? Um, third step is checking out educational modules. So just like Port Swigger Academy has these educational modules for you to learn how to use Burp Suite, also Hacker One has that too in Bug Crowd University. Um, Hacker One 101, um, they have a syllabus that you can go through so you can understand all the different things. They also have a CTF for you to try out, which is great because you're putting, you know, what you're learning into practice, which I'm totally in love with because it's gamification at its best. Um, there's also Bug Crowd University, and they have plenty of different uh, modules and videos for you to watch, for you to have a better understanding of how to get started in hunting. They even have advanced stuff as well. Fourth step is just doing it. Sign up on Hacker One and Bug Crowd, because let's be real, every bug bounty hunter is on both of them. So sign up on it and start looking at it. Start seeing what are things you want to do. What are the companies that are on there that you want to try to find a vulnerability for and report it? Um, just, just note that when you get started, it can take weeks to months to find something. And this is also common for people that are incredible bug bounty hunters that are, are millionaires because of it. Um, the chances are there are times where you're not going to find anything for weeks and months, and it's going to be disheartening. But the thing is, it's persistence and passion, which makes someone good at what they do in life. And so just know that about bug bounty hunting is that everyone starts at the very beginning and you keep going forward by pushing yourself and being passionate about it. And it has to be more than just money of why you want to do it. There has to be another reason why you like doing bug bounty. Those are the most successful stories that I've heard. Also make sure to check out Disclose.io. You want to make sure that you are going to report to companies that support people like you. 
um, that care about hacker rights, that are fighting for hacker rights, because there's too many companies out there that are using the CFAA and DMCA against hackers when they report something. So it's important to work with companies that are wanting to work with you and want to protect your rights and not go after people in our community. And please remember this. If you get started in bug bounty, you have to promise to the bug bounty community that you will not go out of scope and exploit. Because when you do, you make the hacker community look bad and companies lose trust. And it's taken so long to get to where we are today because of this bilateral trust that we have. And it's still a very fine line. So do not cross it because when you do, you're crossing it against everyone in the hacker community and what they have fought so hard to get. And lastly, because we are talking also about women in Bug Bounty, we have to talk about it. And unfortunately, the statistics are that only about 4% of hackers in the world identify as women. And we have probably less than 1% that participate in Bug Bounty. And the reason for that is that it's very male dominated and it can be very aggressive and it does harass women in online communities. I am not going to lie about that. I have dealt with it. It is not fun. And yes, many of us actually use fake male names for protection. Um, and this is also because there's not as many women because there's a lack of representation. Unfortunately, it is true. When we don't see people that are like us in a certain field, it's disheartening and it's even a harder climb to get to because we need to have representation everywhere to be able to be successful and to know that we can achieve it too. So just note that there are women out there that have become successful in bug bounty and those are folks that you want to follow and we'll talk about those in a bit, I promise. But the next step for you to do is is to join supportive communities. It's very, very important for you to do so. Uh, supportive communities help us so we don't feel isolated and alone when we're getting started or even when we're in it and we're advanced, at least we have each other's backs. And so um, it's important to note that there are communities out there that are there to support you. Um, and this could be in these giant bug bounty forums. There are some private groups just for women in there. Um, you just kind of need to know who to ask in it. Um, but if you are in any of the big ones, just reach out to me and I'll let you know and get you a private invite if needed. Um, also do note that a lot of companies at this time are pushing for basically bug bounty platforms such as BugCrowd, HackerOne, and Cynac to get more women onto their platform because they understand with diverse people, you find other vulnerabilities that other people cannot. Because our backgrounds are who we are and have formed us and we see the world differently. And that's why we find things different from other folks. And that's why it's important to make sure that there are women that are represented in the bug bounty field. So then we can able to find more vulnerabilities than other people can. Um, and so that's really important. And that's why companies are trying to push for that change because those statistics are bleak. I am not going to lie, hold back on it. It is terrible to see those numbers when you think that 50% of the world are women. So it shouldn't be this way. It should be easy for us to participate in it. And unfortunately, it can, it can at times, but at many times, it, a lot of times, doors are closed to you. So that's why it's really important to be a part of communities that are going to support and empower you. And there are bug bounty women groups that have been formed. Um, we are hackers, formerly known as women hackers. We actually started a bug bounty like group within it. We have a public one and a private one inside uh, We Are Hackers. Um, so do feel free to join us. Um, you just simply apply by going to our website and uh, basically sharing your LinkedIn profile, why you want to join, and your email. And once again, this is for marginalized genders. This isn't just for women. This is for anyone who is not a cis man. Um, because we know how hard it is to be marginalized in this field. It is not fun sometimes. And it's annoying when you get harassed. And we want to be there to support you. Um, so I do recommend joining us if you want to get in Bug Bounty or you're in Bug Bounty. Because we have a pretty cool platform within it. Um, to support one another in bug bounty and how to get started. And also, last but not least, like I mentioned earlier, 
We need to follow these badass people um, who are rocking in Bug Bounty. Um, Inside her PhD, she has an incredible YouTube page that basically shares how to get started, what are the best tips when you're getting started in Bug Bounty, and I highly recommend it. And then you have Alyssa Herrera and Security Bytes, also known as Jesse Kinzer. And I have to admit, those two people inspire me and probably would inspire you too in Bug Bounty. They are killing it and have been killing it for many years in Bug Bounty. And I have to admit, these are incredible people to follow. And I probably am missing some folks, but I promise you, um, these are at least three of them that you can definitely follow at this time. So I'll review some steps. Sign up for Hacker One and or Bug Crowd because you have to do both anyway if you're a hunter. That's what everyone does. Um, download Burp Suite Community is completely free and you need to learn how to use it because Burp Suite is your tool um, besides Google. Google's my other big tool, I guess. Um, also know your rights and what companies are supporting ethical hackers because we are at a point right now that we are not going to keep dealing with companies that are going to attack our community members that are doing their job and staying within scope and not exploiting. Heck no, we're not going to work for those companies and we won't report disclosures at all. And by disclosures, I mean, we're not going to submit any, any vulnerabilities to them if this is the way they're going to act because we need to protect each other more than ever. Just like companies protect themselves, we're protecting our community as well. Study and read the Web Application Hacker's Handbook, the second edition, if you want. But once again, you just go to Portsburger Academy to learn everything that's on there. Um, Web Hacking 101 and Bug Bounty by Peter Yersky are really good books, so check them out. You need to read and study them. Also, ask questions. Once again, Google is your best friend. Google before you go and DM anyone on Twitter on, around Bug Bounty because let me tell you, most of the time, those answers are in Google. So please do that first. Um, check out these education platforms, HackerOne, 101, Bug Crowd University, Portsmouth Academy. Those are three really good ways how to learn how to use Burp Suite, but also how to do bug bounty in general. Um, sign this ethical hacker's rights petition and share it. It's a petition that is pushing forward for public awareness and for the press and organizations to be aware of the hacker community, that we're not criminals, we're actually individuals that are trying to help people. Um, there's a difference between a hacker and a criminal. Um, and I always like to use the phrase locksmith is basically what we call a hacker and a burglar is a criminal or an attacker or cyber criminal. So those that go out of scope and do exploit, those guys go into the criminal side. So please take a look at this petition, sign it, share it, have loved ones sign it, have your friends, family, colleagues, anyone. We need to push this out more than ever. And it's the first step how to start getting rights and working with organizations that are pushing for hacker rights as well. If you're interested in learning more about hacker rights, do contact me. It's something that I do on the side um, as well because I'm trying to change the stereotype that basically our public has about the hackers in the community. Also, please do note, don't ever go alone. Don't feel isolated when you're starting out in bug bounty. There's so many of us in, that are beginners that are trying to do our best. Um, and so it's really important is to join underrepresented groups um, for bug bounty hunters, um, such as We Are Hackers. We have one as well. Um, and just start following some amazing folks in, in bug bounty. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I am now going to put on my camera so you guys can see me. Hello. Anyway. Um, Let's go into the final thing, which is thank you guys so much for existing and thank you to Diana Initiative for giving me the opportunity to give a talk about Bug Bounty. You guys feel free to reach out to me at any time. My DMs are open on Instagram and Twitter. That is my handle right there. And that is my website. If there's anything you want to know about me or anything at all, it is on there. Um, so feel free to have fun with that. And yes, that is Luna and Sherlock once again proud parent of Sheba's always. Um, anyway, I just want to say thanks so much. Please stay safe, everyone. Please wear a mask. We are still in COVID-19, and it's so important to keep everyone safe at this time. And once again, if you're someone who's trying to get into bug bounty, don't give up. You've got to keep going. Be passionate. And yes, there's going to be times where you're not going to find anything, and that's okay. Just take a break and go back to it. 
The thing is you have to be passionate about something and wanting to constantly learn. And that's how you rock it in bug bounty at the end of the day. Anyway, thank you again to Diana Initiative. And thanks you guys. Stay safe. If you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out to me. My DMs are always open. And also I am still here in the community. So feel free to ask any questions. All right. In the meantime, take care. Bye everyone.